start button. There we go. And uh, probably what I'll do is once I make sure it turns out right, I'll put it on YouTube or something and let send a link to the search committee and let them give it out to the church so anybody that wasn't here could see it and anybody that hasn't or that is here and would like to hear it again, which that would be fun, uh, uh, could do that. Um, so we'll, we'll see if that's, that's a help to you uh, this morning. So I was sitting there while you were singing, uh, brother, and listening to what you were saying, and it crossed my mind that I have not been a candidate for a pastor in a church in 20 years. <laughs> that's, that's been uh, quite a while. And uh, the last church I pastored, I, I left it, it was uh, in early October of 2014, so eight years ago almost, and uh, came up here to serve as the associational leader for the Bay Association, and that's what I've been doing, that and then uh, on my other work that I do that was related to that was I would teach online for Liberty University and Spring Arbor. And uh, would that be the other part of my bivocational ministry? So that's that's what I've been doing. But if the Lord leads y'all to call me here, then I will still continue to do the Bay Association work. But uh, instead of doing the uh, Liberty University and Spring Arbor teaching, uh, I would just limit that to working with Doctor of Ministry students and uh, and be your pastor. So. Uh, We'll see how the Lord leads, and what I'd like to do today, and, and again, I'm, I'm still trying to set up this whole thing with me being up here, because uh, since I've been up here doing the associational work, I haven't really had the opportunity to preach as often as I thought I would, and so my preaching skills have rusted a little bit, so uh, if... Uh, uh, if, if I'm just, I think I'm going to be a little rusty today, but I'll let you decide that. But you just give me some time, and I think uh, I think it'll get better. So uh, sometimes if you don't use it, you lose it, right? That's what they say. Okay. Well, uh, let me pray, and then we'll get into the text I want us to look at today, and then uh, what I want to share with you this morning is basically my vision for what I would like, how I would like to lead this church if you call me to be your next pastor. So let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity this morning to uh, share with this church, uh, to consider the what ifs and the possibilities that uh, could be here. Lord, I thank you for this moment. And Lord, we just want your will to be done. And we want your word to be done and your work. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would open our hearts, minds, and eyes, and Lord, if it's your will for me to come here and serve as their next pastor, that you would make that very clear, very plain. And if not, Lord, the same thing. We, will, we definitely want the right person here for the times that we're in. And so, Lord, have your will and way, work in our hearts today, and Lord, if, if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that by that before the end of this day, that they would surrender their lives to Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So the text I'd like us to look at this morning is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The version of Scripture I'm using this morning is the New American Standard Bible. But I'm pretty sure what you have is going to be going to read pretty similar. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for 
correction or training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Those are the two verses I just want to use this morning as we look together at, I guess, my heart, my vision of what I would do if you call me to be your next pastor. And it kind of comes right out of here because I think that everything we do should be Bible-centered. It should come from the Word. So I would be a Bible-centered pastor. I, I believe exactly what the Scripture tells us right here, that it's inspired by God, that, that the words and the, the letters and everything we have here in what we call the Bible comes from God. It's His love letter to us. It's His gift to us. It's His guide for us. And we thrive and we prosper when we heed his word. In fact, he says it's profitable. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I like to profit. <laughs> uh, I think all of us do. Uh, in a day for, that we live in today where it seems like there's not a lot of profit going on, uh, at least by, at least us regular folks aren't profiting a lot. Um, but it's profitable for teaching. Uh, God hasn't left us out in the world wondering how he wants us to live, uh, how he's ordered the world, how he wants us to serve and what he wants us to believe and what is true and what is good and what is right. He's given that to us in his word. And his word is useful for reproof. In other words, God's word tells us you messed up. You sinned. That's wrong. But God's word is pretty clear about those things. But God, again, doesn't stop there and just say that's wrong. But he tells us, he corrects us. It says it's profitable for correction. It's, he tells us not only what's wrong, but this is what you should have done. Instead of that, this is what you ought to have done. And then he doesn't just tell us what we did wrong or what we should have done, but then he says it's profitable for training in righteousness. In other words, he doesn't just tell us what we should have done, but he tells us this is how you should have done it. This is the attitude you should have had when you did it uh, or when you do it. And so uh, the scripture is so important for us. We need to know it so that we can follow God correctly. But not only that, but verse 17 tells us that it's profitable in such a way that the man of God may be adequate. And if we would bring it, if we would expand on the word man of God, I think Paul is saying that the, the believer, the man or the woman of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now I know sometimes as Christians we often feel inadequate, that we're just not up to the task that God has called us to do. And I think sometimes we short, uh, we, we, we set ourselves short because we're not spending time in the word. We're not trusting the Lord as we should. We're not standing on the promises of God as we sing about that we're doing. Uh, so if, if you want to be adequate and not feel inadequate for the task of living your Christian life, of serving in the church and outside of the church, then you need the scripture. And then he adds at the end of verse 17, equipped for every good work. So good works are a part of the Christian life. Uh, James talks about that in James chapter 2. If a man says he has faith but have no works, can that faith save him? Well, no, because your works are going to follow your faith. If, it, if it's true faith, true faith actually has works. And I know we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works. Ephesians tells us that. 
But in that same passage of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, sometimes we leave off verse 10 where it says that uh, we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So part of the reason we're saved is for service, not just to warm the pew or to have our names on the roll or just be present. It's to serve the Lord. And so what's, what would this look like for me as your pastor trying to lead the church here? What, what might that look like? Well, again, uh, this passage is important to me. I hope it's important to you. And I would try to lead the church to be Bible-centered. Bible-centered. And what would that look like? Well, it would involve reading the Word. Reading it. I mean, just not only here in the in the worship service, but but incorporating the word into our Sunday school classes. Of course, those ought to be based on the Word of God. Um, it should be central to the worship service, and it should be uh, read and shared at other times of the meetings of the church whenever we meet. That's that important. Uh, so we would read the word together and we would study it together. We would preach the word. I think the teaching and preaching ministry of the church is vital. It's important. Um, it's one of the main gathering points of the people of the church during the week where they are exhorted and encouraged through God's word. So we would read the word. We would preach the word. We would pray the word together. I know that when I met with the search committee, they shared with me that one of the strengths of this church is your prayer ministry, how you pray for each other. And, and I want that to continue. In fact, praying is so important. It, it, it's, it's indispensable. We can't do the Lord's work without prayer. A church that doesn't pray is a proud church. They feel like they can do it on their own, but we can't. Without him, which we're going to sing at the end of the service, we can do nothing. Without him, we'd surely fail. So that's why we need to pray. We acknowledge our dependence and our need for the Lord. And there's another hymn that speaks to this, and you've sung it, I'm sure, before. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. That's why we need to pray. God invites us to pray. He encourages us to pray. He commands us to pray. We need to pray. So we'll read the word, we'll preach the word, we'll pray the word, we'll sing the word together. We'll sing doctrinally sound songs and hymns and spiritual songs that are written in such a way that it's designed to be sung together as a congregation. Um, now there's some wonderful songs on the radio and stuff and I like those. But many of those aren't designed to be sung as a group, as a congregation. So while they're good, I don't know that they find a lot of value as we try to sing together on a Sunday morning. But we're going to sing the Word. And then we're going to see the Word. We're going to see the Word. And how does that happen? In the ordinances of the church. When we observe the Lord's Supper together. We see, we memorialize, we symbolize what the Lord has done for us through his body and his blood on the cross. And then we also see the word when we baptize others. And they go through the waters of baptism and they're buried, they're immersed down into the water, buried with Christ in baptism, and they come out risen to walk in newness of life. So we see the word at work in both of the ordinances of the church. And then we're going to share the word together. We're going to share the word with the lost. 
with those who are far from God. And we're going to do it indiscriminately. We're not going to say, well, I think that guy's probably open to the gospel. Well, maybe he will be, but we don't know. So if we just do like Jesus did in the parable of the sower where he just scattered the seed, and we don't know where it's fallen, whether it's on the, the good fertile ground or if it's in the weeds or if it's on the rocks or whatever it is. But if we just scatter the seed, the Lord said he would bring the people in. There, there would be a harvest. And I think that in the church, the church needs to have a culture of evangelism that permeates everything we do, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's worship, whether it's other programs the church does, um, partnerships, whatever it is. Why do we do that? Because people need to know the Lord and we need to do whatever way we can. How can we take what we're doing and use it to share the gospel with people? Very important. Why is that important? Why should we evangelize? Because the word of God commands us to share the gospel with all people everywhere. Why do they need to hear the gospel? Because they're lost. The Bible says that. They're far from God. The Bible says they're under the wrath of God. On their way to hell. And their only hope is Jesus Christ. And if we know that and they don't, we need to tell them. You know, just the other day, you probably all heard about it already. President Biden decided to cancel the federal student loan debt of up to $10,000 for those earning less than $125,000 a year. And there's more to the what he said than just that, but at a bare minimum, that's what he said. That, that's what came from Washington, from the president. Well, in my bivocational teaching position with Liberty and Spring Arbor Universities, I subscribe through email to uh, to a, uh, a document called the Chronicle of Higher Education. And generally it has a leftist perspective on education, but there was an article in there about what the president did. And there was a picture in this article of students outside some building holding up signs that said, cancel student debt. Now I don't know if they meant some of it or all of it. They probably meant all of it. And, and I got to thinking when I saw that picture that not only students, but all people everywhere have a debt that most don't realize they're going to have to pay. The debt everyone owes is owed to God because of their own personal sin. Everyone has sinned against God. We've all broken God's law and there's a fine. There's a penalty. There are wages to be paid to God. And the Bible tells us very clearly that the wages of sin is death, which amounts to eternal separation from God and eternal punishment in hell. And the default position of everyone that's ever been born since Adam and Eve, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, is that you are a sinner in need of a Savior without which you have no hope. And that's bad. That's a bad place to be. That's bad news. But the good news is this, that God, who is rich in mercy, demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent Jesus to live a perfect, righteous, holy, obedient life for us that we never live and also to die on a cross and pay the wages, not for his sins because he never committed any, but for the sins of everyone who would believe and trust and have faith in him. And after three days, he arose from the dead, victorious over sin and death in the grave. And the Bible says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what people need to hear. People need to know that only in Christ can they find what they most deeply need. We did break God's law. We are guilty and Jesus paid our fine. And only those who personally apprehend and appropriate through faith Christ's payment for their sin will actually experience true biblical freedom and the forgiveness of sin 
and eternal life. Because nobody can save you except Jesus. Your parents can't, your grandparents can't, your kids can't, your friends can't. Only Christ can. So reach out to him and trust what he did, that he, what he did for sinners on that cross, he did for you. And at the end of the service this morning, or after the service, I want anyone and everyone today who has decided that yes, today, I am trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want you to tell me that. Or tell Pastor Rick. Or tell Brother Rick or Brother Steve. Tell Stanley, somebody, so that we can help you get started in your growing in your life as a Christian. So if I become your pastor, we're going to read the word, we're going to preach the word, we're going to pray the word, we're going to sing the word, we're going to see the word, and we're going to share the word. And I'll just cut to the chase here, folks. If I, I, I believe this book. I believe in the infallibility, the sufficiency, the authority, and the truthfulness of this book from Genesis to Revelation. Every single word. And whatever the Bible says, that's what we're going to do. And if you don't want to do that, don't vote me in. But if you do want that, then vote me in, and that's what we're going to do. It's going to look like expositional, verse by verse, book by book, studying through God's Word, and we're not going to skip the hard stuff. There's some hard stuff in here. I'm still trying to figure some of it out. Every time I read the Bible, I come across something and I'm like, hmm, what does that really mean? Does that happen to you? I know it does to me. But we're not going to skip that stuff. We're going to deal with it as we come to it in our study of the Scriptures. And so we're going to be Bible-centered. But another thing we're going to be, if I become your pastor, is unashamedly Baptist. Unashamedly Baptist. Now, I am not ashamed to be called a Baptist. I'm a Christian first. I'm a Protestant second. And a Baptist third. And I, But I believe really that if a person reads the Bible and tries to live out what the Bible says for him or her personally and follows what it teaches about the church, being Baptist is the most normal, natural result. I am convinced of that. So I am not ashamed to be a Baptist. I am not ashamed to have the name Baptist on the church sign. Many Baptist churches have dropped the name Baptist, but they haven't gained anything by doing it. They just might have caused some trouble in the church by fighting over changing the name. So I think we ought to be honest with everyone and fly the flag of who we are. I don't think saying that our church is a Baptist church hinders how effective our church can serve our community. I don't think it's going to matter. I think it's dishonest for a church to hide deep down in their bylaws who they really are and who they cooperate with. Just admit it. Be upfront about it. 99% of lost people don't even know the difference between Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians and probably 75% of Baptists don't know either. So what, what is it that really hinders a church's ministry? Isn't that they have Baptists in their name. It's the meanness. It's the hypocrisy. It's the fighting in churches. It's when the church is more like the world than the family of God. That's what hinders the witness of the church. We should not be saying our father on Sunday and living like orphans the rest of the week. Amen? Amen. So, yes, I would be unashamedly Baptist. And in the book, I taught a seminary extension course uh, probably a year ago now um, on Baptist history. And in the book, The Baptist Story, the authors of that book discuss why some people are Baptists and what are particularly Baptist convictions. Let me just real quickly explain three reasons why some people are Baptists. 
All right, number one, some people are Baptist by conditioning. Conditioning. This is the person whose Christian experience has mostly been limited to Baptist churches. They might have been raised in a Baptist church or they might have been converted through the ministry of a Baptist church or they might have married a Baptist and joined his or her church. Someone who is a Baptist by conditioning is such because it is rooted in their family heritage or long-term church participation. The famous Baptist preacher R.G. Lee once quipped this. He said, I'm a, he says, I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. <laughs> That's a Baptist by conditioning, okay? Some people are Baptist by convenience because they presently attend a Baptist church. That's just where they go. This person's only Baptist because that's the church that they're currently attending. And often someone who is Baptist by convenience could just as easily be Methodist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal. But because he or she likes the Baptist church he currently attends, he's now Baptist for now. And in this day we live in of what I would call post-denominationalism, that's a big word, many people move from church to church based on the preaching, the music style, the programs, no matter what the denominational affiliation might be. So there's uh, those that are, are Baptist by convenience. And then those are, there are those who are Baptist by conviction because their beliefs, their problems, match those that have been historically identified with being Baptist. A Baptist by conviction considers himself a Baptist ultimately because of what he believes. Now, I would say for me that I'm a mixture of being a Baptist by conditioning, because that's how I was brought up. I was raised up that way, and by conviction. But I'm primarily Baptist out of conviction. I believe that the Baptist faith most closely resembles the clear teaching of Scripture. And there are five distinctives that I believe most clearly set apart Baptists from other denominations. Let me go through what those five things are that, that make us unashamedly Baptist. One is something we call regenerate church membership. You're like, what is that? Well, a regenerate church membership is, where, is that Baptists have historically insisted that the Bible clearly teaches that a local church's membership should be comprised only of individuals who provide credible evidence that they have repented of their sins and trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior. In other words, only born-again believers should be members of a Baptist church. We want to make sure they're saved. The church is for saved people. And they're the ones who should join the church. The New Testament indicates that the earliest churches included only professing believers in their membership. In fact, the New Testament pattern is that you must believe before you can belong. And that's what we should insist upon in this church. So regenerate church membership. Number two, believers' baptism. Believer's baptism. Related to insisting that a church membership only consists of born-again believers, the issue of believer's baptism is the belief that only individuals who give a credible testimony of personal faith in Christ should be baptized. In other words, you don't baptize lost people. You baptize people who trusted in Christ. And that's what we should insist upon in the church as well. We don't see any evidence in the Bible anywhere of a known unbeliever being baptized. And those in non-Baptist churches that practice the baptism of infants have a practice that is in search of a theology to support it. Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics, and Orthodox Christians even disagree with one another on why infants should be baptized. Well, they shouldn't. And that's also why I'm Baptist. If you take the plain, simple, natural reading of Scripture, I think you will end up at the Baptist position of only baptizing people who are old enough and who understand enough 
to make their own personal profession of faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. Then added to that, we also believe that the proper mode of baptism is by immersion under the water and back up again because why? Because when a person is placed under the water, it pictures their death to sin and when they're come up out of the water, it pictures their uh, being risen to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Um, so let me, let me move to the, the third distinctive. Congregational polity. What is that? Polity is a word that means how a church is structured and how it functions, how it operates. Congregationalism is the belief that local churches should be governed by their own membership as they follow the teaching of Scripture. Baptists believe there is ample evidence in the Bible showing that the entire local church is responsible for maintaining its membership and selecting its officers. And the officers of the church are pastors and deacons. Those are the two officers according to Scripture that we see in, that this should be in the church. It's based upon the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, which teaches that every member of the church is a minister. Did you know that? You're saying you're a member of this church? Guess what? You're a minister in this church. You're a minister, and you have a ministry in the church. And I believe with that in mind that every member of the church needs to have a way and a place to serve within the church. There's got to be a way, a, a place, somehow, that everybody can serve. Not only in the church, but also God has placed you in a vocation, perhaps, and a location outside the church where you're to serve as his ambassador. You represent him wherever you go. And you share his gospel through your life and your lips, your words and your works and your walk and your talk. Each local congregation is a Christocracy under the kingship of Jesus Christ and is to be comprised only of believers who are committed to the lordship of Christ and the authority of Scripture. So to sum up what congregational polity is, healthy Christ-centered congregational means that each local church should be ruled by Jesus Christ governed by its members, led by its pastors, and served by its deacons. That seems to be the biblical way that churches are to function. Next, local church autonomy. Did you know that you're an independent church? You absolutely are. Now you affiliate, you associate with the Southern Baptist Convention, with the Baptist State Convention of Michigan, the Bay Area Baptist Association. But you are an autonomous, independent church. In fact, what local church autonomy means is that Christ alone is the Lord of the church. He's the head of the church. And in accordance with the teaching of Scripture and seeking the Lord in prayer and obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit, this church and every church is or should be free to follow the Lord's teaching in their worship and in their witness. Um, we don't receive orders. We don't receive instructions or edicts from denominational headquarters. You know why? Because the local church is the headquarters of the SBC, the state convention and the association. Those organizations exist to serve our church, the church doesn't exist to serve them. So let me go to the final Baptist distinctive. It's religious freedom. Religious freedom. Back in 1858, Baptists put together a document called the Abstract of Principles that discusses religious freedom this way. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And he has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are in any way contrary to his word or not contained in it. 
civil magistrates being ordained of God ought to be obeyed by us in the Lord in all lawful things commanded by them, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. So basically, religious liberty or religious freedom functions on the personal level like church autonomy does on the corporate level. But there's a danger of taking this too far into a freedom that's untethered from accountability to one's local church. Liberty of conscience should provide freedom for Christians to follow Christ's will as it's revealed in Scripture while remembering that one day we will all stand before him to give an account for our faith and practice. But let me share this last little aspect of what religious freedom is about. People often forget this historically about us as Baptists. Related to religious freedom is to believe that everyone should be free to worship according to his or her own faith. We might believe some are wrong in the faith they profess, but we believe they should have the freedom to believe and profess it. Because if the gov government limits a religion because it disagrees with them, they could come after us too. And we want everyone to be free to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. So to have an equal playing field, Baptists have supported the rights of everyone to hold their religious opinions, and this church should continue to insist upon that. So to conclude, if you call me to be your next pastor, I would be Bible-centered, I would be unashamedly Baptist, and finally, I would work to build fellowship in the church. This would occur by visiting members in your home, having you in ours, by communicating well with you in person, and online about what's going on in the church. By sharing meals together more often as a church family. And by gathering in community, even if it's just for fun, or if it's for study or for service, formally or informally, we need each other. And we need to know each other better and get together more often than just on Sunday. So if I become your next pastor, you will get a man who will lead the church to be Bible-centered, unashamedly Baptist, and who will do his part to build fellowship within the body. So let me ask you a question. Can God turn this church around? Yes, he can. Will God turn this church around? I don't know. But I'm going to believe and work as if he will. And whoever becomes your next pastor, let me just ask you to do this, or don't do this. Don't look to him as a savior. That he's going to come in and save the day and save the church. There's only one savior and one head of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to take all of us working together, praying together, following Christ together, trusting him to do through us whatever he wants to do. And last time I checked with this book, God is pretty good at resurrecting things. So I'm believing that he will do that to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, I just ask your blessings upon this church. Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide them to do what they should do regarding their next pastor, whether that's me or whether that might be someone else. We just want your will to be done, Lord. And Father, I pray as we close out the service today the gospel's been shared maybe if there's one here this morning or more that has seen their need for Christ and
desires to trust in him as their Lord and Savior, that today, Lord, they would perhaps come while we sing this last song and share it with me or Pastor Rick, or after the service, pull us aside and say, I want to know more. I want to follow Christ. What do I do? And so, Lord, do what you need to do as we wrap things up here this morning. And we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.